Okay, uh, so good, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the uh, DOE user meeting for uh, Actinium uh, 2 to 5. So we have um, the panel of the distinguished speakers uh, who will be talking about everything from the production of Actinium to regulatory issues, uh, to research, to clinical uh, application. So uh, before uh, we start, I will give a brief introduction about the Actinium and then uh, the talks of our panel members uh, will start. So all the questions uh, should be saved for the question and answer session for the sake of time. So please don't ask speakers the questions right after they finish, but save them for the question and the answer uh, session. So I will now try to share my screen. All right, so uh, Actinium 225, uh, the uh, radionuclide which we'll be talking about was uh, discovered in 1947 by a team of physicists from Argonne National Lab led by Dr. Hegeman and independently by a Canadian group led by Dr. English. So on the left, you see the uh, schematic of Actinium decay so this is the route when actinium was born from uranium-233 uh, and uh, then it uh, decays to thorium-229, then to uh, uh, radium-225, which give birth of actinium-225. So actinium-225 is a mixed uh, emitter. So the prominence of actinium comes from its ability to decay with five alpha decays with the half uh, life of 9.9 .9 days. Uh, if administered uh, in vivo, actinium-225 becomes a so-called um, in vivo generator. When being in vivo, it, it generates the cascade uh, of uh, alpha particles. It goes uh, through intermediate daughters, francium, astatine, and then bismuth-213. Bismuth-213 is in itself a prominent alpha emitter with the users in um, clinical and uh, translational research. It's in itself either small um, in vivo generator because it decays through intermediate daughters uh, to stable uh, bismuth uh, 209. Um, so uh, actinium 225 uh, has been used uh, in clinic. The idea of uh, using actinium 225 and its radioactive daughter Bismuth-213 was expressed in uh, uh, 1993. Uh, here you see the um, link uh, to Dr. Gerling's paper. So the first use of um, its daughter, Bismuth-213, that's how it started in the clinic, was reported uh, in 1999. And we are fortunate to have um, Dr. Joseph Jurcic, who is a pioneer of using alpha emitters in the clinic, both bismuth-213 and actinium-225 with us as a member of this uh, panel and the speaker. And uh, in 2011, the paper came out again with Dr. Jurcic as the first author, which described uh, the use of actinium-225 in the clinic. Interestingly, uh, for both bismuth-213 and actinium-225, uh, the use in the clinic came in the form of radio-labeled antibodies to certain cancer antigens and the use of actinium-225 and bismuth in form of small molecules or peptides came out later. On the right, you see the table. Uh, can you see, still see? In, uh, you see the table uh, from the uh, recent uh, publication by Morgenstern et al., uh, which shows the uh, current uh, clinical trials uh, finished or uh, being still conducted, where actinium or bismuth labeled uh, molecules are being used. And you see that the range of application is uh, pretty uh, wide. So actinium-225 or bismuth-213 have been used for leukemia, lymphoma, uh, melanoma, uh, bladder cancer, glioma, neuroendocrine tumors, and uh, prostate cancer. The most uh, recent application with PSMA-617 labeled with actinium-225 for patients who failed uh, beta emitter 
form uh, of this molecule. So this is the brief introduction uh, to give you the taste uh, of uh, actinium-225. And by the way, on my uh, previous slide, there is a photo showing actinium glowing in the dark. I'm sure there are a lot of photos like this floating around, but this was taken in our lab when I was still at the Albert Einstein uh, College of Medicine. So I think it's really neat photo which represents the glow, the promising glow of actinium, uh, which uh, hopefully will translate in a lot of uh, clinical successes uh, in the future. And with that, I finish my uh, brief introduction and uh, we can uh, now move to the uh, speakers in our session. So should I introduce already our speakers, Karen? Uh, you can introduce Kathy, she's up next. Right, okay. So our next speaker will be Dr. Kathy Cutler from Brookhaven National Lab. So uh, Dr. Cutler will talk about the uh, production of actinium 2 to 5 through accelerator route. So Dr. Cutler, please go ahead with your presentation. Um, I'm going to be talking about the TriLab effort in producing accelerator um, actinium 2 to 5. Kevin John is actually the project manager for this, and normally he'd be giving this talk, um, but due to his expertise and the lab needed him for other efforts in COVID-19. So I'm gonna give you a brief perspective on the supply and demand of Actinium-225, um, looking at alternate production methods. I'm gonna give you an update on the high accelerator production of Actinium-225 and some uh, updates on the 227. I'm also gonna talk about some additional routes that the DOE is pursuing, um, understanding that diversity and supply is a good thing, and then give you an update on the, on the drug master file. So as Kate pointed out, Oak Ridge National Laboratory has been a real leader in um, providing Actinium-225. Um, they extracted this material from waste that had been produced um, years earlier in breeder reactors, and then they developed the technology to set up the Thorium-229 generator, um, which is demonstrated on your right-hand side. From this uh, generator, they've supplied 10 curies of Actinium-225 and shipped it out in over 1,500 packages. They typically go through six to 12 campaigns per year and are currently on campaign number 156. If you look at the graph below, what you can see in blue is highlighted the production capacity, um, which has increased over the years, but what you can see is that we have reached the, the production capacity of this generator. And green has actually showed the dispensed activity mm -hmm. which also increased, but again, we are reaching the limit of what this generator can provide. And in red is the number of shipments, which you see has increased um, over the years. So currently worldwide, there's about 1.2 to 1.7 uh, curies of actinium-225. Um, for patients for the actinium, we need roughly about 160 to 640 microcuries to treat the patient, um, depending on the agent that's being used. For bismuth, it's about one millicurie per patient. So you can see that the um, limited availability limits the clinical trials that can be performed by this. And because of this, this is why a number of agencies, including the IAEA, the workshop by the US Department of Nuclear Energy and Nuclear Physics, and the NSAC indicated that actinium-225 was an isotope that the isotope program should focus on um, supplying. So based on this, the isotope program looked at um, the many routes that could be used to actually provide actinium-225. I'm not gonna go through explaining each of these production routes, but in looking at this, what they did is looked at what would be needed at the end. And particularly, you need a robust um, production method that can supply actinium-225 and large amounts to support clinical trials and needs to be reliable and supplied on a routine basis because that's when patients need it. It needs to meet the quality that it can be um, used and it needs to have a target material that's readily available. Um, Radium-226 has limited availability and it can be a challenge to work with due to some of its gaseous um, emissions. So the route based on this criteria uh, that they wanted to pursue was the spallation reaction on thorium-232. 
So Los Alamos actually looked at um, the cross sections for this fallation reaction on thorium-232 and showed that once you get above 70 MeV, the cross sections for this reaction increase and are such that when they evaluated at two of the isotope uh, program facilities, Los Alamos, which has incident energies of 100 MeV and currents now that can go up to 450 microamps, with the single 10-day irradiation, they could produce 1.3 to 2.3 curies. Um, this is more than currently is available. And then Brookhaven National Laboratory, um, which routinely operates at 165 microamps and can go up to 200 MeV on a single 10-day irradiation, um, could produce 2.2 curies. Uh, Brookhaven does have the ability, because of 200 MeV, to actually irradiate multiple targets to actually increase the amount that can be produced. So based on this, the isotope program put together what was called the TriLab effort. And so this effort brought together these two high energy accelerator facilities with their extensive experience in targetry. Further, both programs had been working together for years to supply isotopes year round, particularly strontium and germanium. They have significant experience in meeting um, the regulations for the FDA. Oak Ridge was brought into this because of their extensive experience in working with actinium-225, in particular in extracting it from complex mixtures and then being able to provide it in a form that was of need to the end users. So by performing this tri effort, they brought together the experience that was needed of targetry, chemistry, QA, and transportation to really address this complex problem, which was one of the things the Department of Energy is good at doing. Now, one of the challenges uh, with this production route is there is a long-lived impurity that's produced, actinium-227, that has a half-life of 21.8 years. And if you look at the graph, what you can see is that the production drops off as you go to higher energies. Um, but one of the challenges is that if you radiate for longer times, it does increase. So the isotope program has really looked at how to optimize um, this ratio to mitigate the amount of 227 that's in there. Still, that the 227 creates a unique set of challenges um, based on licensing and perceptions, and we are working with the NRC to help address these. I should point out that those issues are not unique. There are other isotopes, such as lutetium and germanium, who have had those issues and it has been addressed. So the TriLab effort has been producing actinium-225 from this route um, for a few years now and actually initially sent out this material to have it evaluated. And people looked at the labeling efficiencies and found that the accelerator route was comparable to the generator route. And you'll hear some more of this discussions later by Dr. Sanders. They further supplied this material to be looked at in the generator form to provide bismuth 213 and found that the performance um, was the same as the material from the generator. They further sent it out to experts in the field to look at the impact of the toxicity and dosimetry of the actinium 227, um, which was shown to be negligible. There are still challenges with the 227 due to facility licensing which requires um, decommissioning and funding plans, um, but we are working with the NRC. The NRC has in the past dealt with this, particularly with germanium-68 and lutetium-177 um, as it's gotten into patients. Now, the Department of the Isotope Program realizes that diversity is often needed in isotope supply, and so they have been looking at alternative methods of production. One of them is at Argonne National Laboratory, which is utilizing their unique electron accelerator um, to radiate radium-226, to produce radium-225 as a generator form for actinium. And they've done some initial feasibilities on this. Brookhaven, we are actually looking at the low energy cyclotron route, again, looking at radium-226 based on previous feasibility studies that have been done. And then, uh, Oak Ridge is actually looking at the irradiation of radium-226 to produce the parent thorium-229, which is similar to the route for the generator now. And additionally, the program has submitted a drug master file, and this is for the material that is currently being supplied from Oak Ridge. So BNL and LANO both irradiate the targets, they send the targets to Oak Ridge, and Oak Ridge has been processing and dispensing that material. 
Now, in the future, BNL is actually in the process of bringing up a production facility and will be submitting a DMF so that we will now have two facilities that will actually be supplying the actinium-225 from this route. And then Oak Ridge is working on a DMF for the generator. The isotope program continues to interact with the Food and Drug Administration and with the end users, make sure that we understand what their needs are and that we can develop and ensure we meet the regulatory compliance for people to use this to support their free clinical and clinical uses. So the tri-lab effort is now at the point that we are routinely supplying Actinium-225 and product is, is available. Um, we're currently supplying about 30 to 50 um, millicuries um, on about every six weeks um, basis. We have distributed over 325 millicuries of accelerator material, and we've probably used about that same or more material internally to help us develop the QC methods that we've needed for the DMF. We continue our discussions uh, with those who want to use this material um, to ensure that we can meet their needs as they scale up um, with the use of this. And we are continuing to work on the Actinium-227, which we have supplied to people and they've shown that the dosimetry and toxicity um, is negligible. And as always, if you're interested in this or any other isotope, you can go to www.isotope.gov and they would be happy to supply you with the specifications and to work with you to get some of this material. And thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cutler, for the outstanding presentation. So as I said at the beginning, uh, all the questions should be asked at the end during the Q&A session. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ravindra Kaslival from the FDA, who will be talking about Actinium-225 radiopharmaceuticals, FDA perspective, chemistry, manufacturing, and control. Uh, Dr. Kaslival, please go ahead. Okay, let me share my screen here. What I wanted, why, uh, first of all, my name is Ravi Kaslilo. I'm uh, in the Office of New Drug Products, in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. Uh, our group uh, is engaged in, uh, uh, in assessment of uh, CMC aspects of radiopharmaceutical, both diagnostic and therapeutic drug products. Um, so, um, I have a few slides which I'm mandated to show you. Uh, basically, uh, a quality product of what is pharmaceutical quality. Quality um, uh, product of any kind consistently meets the expectations of the user, and drugs are no different. Uh, patient basically expects safe and effective medications, um, and ensuring safe effective dose is safe and effective, free of contamination, um, be it radionuclides or other defects, is what uh, we are sure, and this is what uh, uh, gives the confidence to the patient in their medicine. So now on to Actinium-225. You've seen this, um, uh, seen the rationale that there have been increasing number of clinical trials with different radiopharmaceutical products for targeted alpha therapy um, and because of that demand is increasing and the current supplies and the mode of production is not sufficient hence there are new production methods um, coming into uh, uh, the scene. Uh, what I intend to discuss briefly is uh, some of the radioisotope quality issues that may be useful with respect to uh, to the radio pharmaceutical product. Uh, uh, so uh, with new method, obviously, the radionuclidic impurity, as uh, Dr. Kepler just said, actinium-227 and actinium-225, uh, which is long-lived. Um, also, when you have uh, multiple production methods, each production method may have some unique impurities. Um, and um, uh, from a radio pharmaceutical manufacturer's perspective, whenever you change the method and beauty profile changes, um, the new material needs to be qualified in some method uh, to assess the safety of uh, a new set of impurities. So that is something uh, to be kept in mind uh, when developing and changing uh, the methods. 
uh, some of the attribute called the attributes that may be useful in assessing radio labeling um, are the quality attributes that is in actinium 225 um, and also some of the issues that are associated um, uh, with decay chain um, uh, uh, the changes in chemistry as uh, one can anticipate as the decay chain uh, progresses. Um, you saw that the reactor produced actinium-225, uh, as Dr. Cutler mentioned. Uh, uh, such information should be uh, submitted to the DMF. And uh, whenever you uh, reference that DMF, uh, make sure uh, to have a letter of authorization for us to reference, uh, to refer to the, the DMF. Uh, uh, FDA, as a reviewer, we're not allowed to access that without the letter of authorization. Um, so, uh, uh, with the uh, upon irradiation, as you noted, the uh, subsequent purification, uh, a variety of undesired radionuclides may be formed. Uh, the most separated, some of them may remain, but uh, they should be quantitated by validated methods. That's something in the DMF we review. Uh, controlling and reporting of impurities generally should be um, uh, both uh, in actinium as well as in the radio pharmaceutical product. Uh, you have to make an assessment, but generally if it's something reproduced with like actinium 227, it's uh, reported as a specified impurity. Um, uh, then each unspecified or unidentified and total radionuclidic impurity is something. Um, the format generally is reported. Uh, so how how the radionuclidic impurity results uh, that the value actinium twenty to in two twenty five that you get it should be in the uh, how how are they useful it should be something that's provided to you in the certificate analysis. Uh, what's important to know is, is how much impurity you have and at what time. So you have, you know, there may be a release criteria, which is, you know, specifications for that um, impurity. Um, and, but the certificate analysis should provide you the actual value for that lot. How is that useful? Uh, you're not forming new impurities during radio pharmaceutical production, radio labeling. Um, I mean, you may form as a result of decay process, which is a separate issue. But how is that information useful? Uh, you may, the results provide COA, um, uh, may be used to determine the radionuclidic amount at the time of patient administration. So up to subsequent radio labeling, since it's not changing, you can calculate what is the patient exposure was. And uh, from that exposure, um, how much uh, radiation dose to the patient um, may be um, you know, relevant and can be assessed uh, from that impurity uh, based on distribution. Uh, safety of radionuclidic impurities uh, initially from preclinical trial to clinical trial. So once you have established the limits, which is based on the amount provided to you in the COA, um, um, you can determine how much you have uh, at the time, uh, you know, at the safe levels, uh, at the start of clinical trials uh, from the preclinical study and uh, in the marketing application based on the results from clinical trials. Uh, so that's how the safety gets established for radio pharmaceutical product. Uh, in establishing specifications, um, um, eventually uh, you will establish some sort of specification in the radio pharmaceutical product um, and then justifying it. Uh, radio, radio, okay. So another attribute of um, um, importance to a radio pharmaceutical manufacturer may, will be um, the specific activity value, uh, how much mass you have in the amount of activity. Uh, basically, this helps them enable um, the molar ratio, ligand to uh, radioactivity molar ratio. 
um, uh, to establish, you know, radio labeling conditions and uh, down the road subsequently to uh, control the radio labeling process from batch to batch. So that is something that's uh, important to know. Uh, other useful information would be data time of manufacture calibration. Um, that is helpful in establishing the use period for uh, that uh, radiochemical actinium nitrate. How long is it useful for? Or beyond certain time, whether you need to purify uh, if your uh, purification procedure for the radiopharmaceutical product uh, are not sufficient to eliminate that. So. Uh, some of the decay products. Uh, so in that respect, uh, 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 the calibration time uh, or date, of man date and time of manufacture is important. Uh, uh, so this is some of the information that's used for from a radioisotope from point of view. There may be other information such as elemental impurities, profiles, and um, um, you know, especially if it's a chelation reaction, uh, some of that information, certificate and analysis may be helpful. Um, so with that, I, I think um, I will end my presentation, but uh, that's how the information that's present for actinium nitrate may be useful um, to a radio pharmaceutical manufacturer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaslival, for outstanding presentation. Very enlightening information, very useful for all of us. So our next speaker will be Dr. Lisa Dimick from Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And she will talk to us about NRC perspective on emerging radionuclides. Dr. Dimick, please go ahead. Thanks again, everyone, and I appreciate this opportunity um, to present today on NRC's perspectives. And I should clarify, it's not Dr. Dimmick, so it's just Lisa Dimmick, but thank you anyway. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. I'll share my screen. Okay, so um, NRC's perspectives on emerging radionuclides. Um, so this is in general for any emerging radionuclide and obviously um, actinium-225 um, could also apply um, um, in this type of evaluation. So I wanted to kind of take you through um, our licensing process or the process that we determine how emerging radionuclides um, should be licensed or would be licensed under the NRC's regulatory requirements. So Title 10 of the Code of Federal Regulations, um, Part 35 Medical Use of Byproduct Material, um, provides um, all of the requirements um, needed for medical use licensees. These regulations include general information, administrative requirements, and technical requirements, and then specific requirements for different modalities. Um, and then um, I want to draw your attention to two subparts because that's what we're going to spend a few minutes talking about. And that is subpart E or 35300, which is the unsealed material written directive required. And what does that mean? Well, in lay terms, the unsealed material written directive required, you could think in terms of these are the radiopharmaceutical therapies or the specific requirements for radiopharmaceutical therapy. And a written directive is a physician's written order for the dosage or or the dose to be administered. So when um, a new radionuclide does not fit in 35300, we have an option in our medical use regulations um, to evaluate other uses of material. And this is our 35100 regulation. And this is where we can evaluate new and emerging technologies on a case-by-case -case basis um, for what the appropriate license conditions should be for emerging um, technologies, including emerging radionuclides. Okay. Um, so if the tech, so let's say a new, um, let me backtrack. I got ahead of myself. <laughs> um, so if the, um, so if an emerging radionuclide doesn't fit in 35300, um, the NRC will develop license conditions um, to meet NRC requirements. Um, in this approach, the NRC staff considers general license requirements, specific radiation safety aspects of the emerging radio technology, the radio, um, the radionuclide, and also training and experience expectations for those who would be authorized users of this technology or this radionuclide. Um, even if we identify that a new emerging technology 
can fit under 35300 or a new radionuclide can fit under 35300 or meets the medical use authorization, we will still evaluate the radiation safety aspects and other regulatory aspects of that emerging radionuclide. So we still will evaluate because there could be new things about this emerging radionuclide that we haven't seen before and may still not quite fit in our medical use regulations. And so we would still maybe do a review of whether or not we would need to develop 35,000 license conditions for that emerging radionuclide. But just for, um, for purposes of this, for under 35,300, the medical use authorization is kind of buried down in the regulations and you can find it under 35,390. So for those parenteral administrations, parenteral administrations being something other than an oral administration. So if the radionuclide, so if it's a parenteral administration of any radioactive drug that contains a radionuclide that is primarily used for its electron emission, beta radiation characteristics, alpha radiation characteristics, or photon energy of less than 150 keV for which a written directive is required, and then some additional items. But for purposes of this, um, this is the authorization or the medical use authorization for radionuclides under Part 35300. So if emerging radionuclides fit this criteria of the use being primarily its electron emission, beta radiation characteristics, alpha radiation characteristics, and photon energy of less than 150 keV, then it will fit the criteria in 10 CFR Part 35300. And we probably don't need to further evaluate um, that, that particular radionuclide. Um, however, um, that is something that we would still do because we are interested in these emerging radio nuclides, um, various radiation safety aspects and regulatory aspects of these emerging radionuclides. For instance, um, we're interested in the radionuclide and the progeny emissions. We're interested in radiation detection and monitoring um, of these um, of emerging radionuclides. D does um, the nuclear the equipment used in a typical nuclear medicine department have the capability to properly detect for, um, air, to conduct area surveys to um, measure for leak, leakage and or contamination of these emerging radionuclides. So we do need to evaluate um, or question um, all aspects of these emerging radionuclides. We're also interested, who, who's the anticipated authorized user? Who's the physician who's going to use these radioactive, these emerging radionuclides? In clinical trials, um, there's typically a certain group of physicians who may be the users, but once a lot of these um, radionuclides um, are on the market and become more widely used, um, we see that the people who are interested to use them evolve and may not be the same group physician type that was maybe involved in clinical trials. So this is an interesting situation that we are often um, dealing with at NRC because we do specify training and experience requirements for physicians who use um, radioactive material in our regulations. We're also interested in how the um, doses are administered. Some of these protocols might be very complex, um, some maybe not. Um, is there some sa radiation safety aspect that we should be aware of um, when we authorize or when we license um, facilities to use these emerging radionuclides? Is there any patient release considerations? Um, probably not for the alpha emitters, um, but maybe some other one, other um, emerging radionuclides, we do have um, issues or we need to be mindful of, you know, facilities need to be aware of requirements for patient release concerning the exposure to members of the general public from those patients. Dose measurement, um, how um, a requirement is to assay or to measure the doses before they're administered. Um, are there anything, is there anything particular about an emerging radionuclide that makes it a challenge to measure, measure the dose or how is the dose um, that's administered, determined prior to administration. Dose delivery, um, this is, are doses coming in unit doses? Or are they gonna be multi-vial, um, multi-dose vials? Um, is splitting of a dose permitted? Uh, just a number of things about handling the dose. And again, in the clinical phase of um, this use, these aren't issues that 
often present, but they often present after um, some of these emerging radionuclides have been um, cleared by the FDA and become more widely used. Um, how people are using them starts to differ than maybe what was um, done during the clinical trials. And then last but not least, and there's probably more things to consider for radiation safety and regulatory aspects, but it is the waste disposal. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Okay, so a couple of recent experiences with emerging radionuclides, and these are radionuclides that have been cleared by the FDA. Um, obviously, there are more um, um, radionuclides in clinical trials that people are using, and but I wanted to talk about some of our recent experiences um, with two in particular because they're, they have a few nuances that kind of paved the way for how we maybe are evaluating radio emerging radionuclides. But anyway, so radium dichloride, um, we um, identified that this um, radionuclide could be licensed under 35300 back in January of 2013. And in doing so, um, there were you know, a number of issues that were evaluated. Um, um, on for this particular um, radionuclide, but I did want to point out that for this one, this was our first, the first alpha emitter um, that was under 35300. Um, so that um, kind of paved the way for some evaluations of dose calibrators, serving meters, and well counter measurements. Again, you know, your nuclear medicine departments need to be able to assay the doses they're giving to patients. They need to be able to survey their areas for contamination and exposure, and they also need to be able to um, detect removable contamination um, with a well counter. Radium dichloride also presented initially or some questions on what were the long-lived contaminants in radium dichloride. Um, and eventually it was um, indicated that um, there aren't any presented in patient doses for, um, of radium dichloride. And the long-lived contaminants at that time are th that are because of its production method could have possibly been the um, actinium-227 and thorium-227. But those were some questions that NRC did have with the vendor on um, the long-lived contaminants and assurances that long-lived contaminants weren't present in the patient doses. Um, more recently, lutetium-177. Again, after evaluating um, lutetium-177 for its radiation safety aspects and other regulatory aspects, we determined it could also be licensed under 35300 without any additional requirements or license conditions. And we did that back in June of 2018. There is an issue with lutetium that most people are aware of, and it's the presence of the metastable lutetium-177 that has a half-life of 161 days. And this does exceed the criteria for decay and storage for medical waste. Um, the half-life for decay and storage um, is 120 days. So when we um, provided our determination on how lutetium you know, could be licensed or would be licensed for medical use licensees, indicating it was under 35300. We did um, provide additional guidance or information that, that the decay and storage regulation is a, intended to be a performance-based regulation, such that if you've held your waste for decay, um, and when it's um, the opportunity to dispose of it, if you can't detect any radiation um, in its background, then you can um, dispose of that waste as regular trash um, without further evaluation. However, if you detect um, radiation and it's still above background, then you can't dispose of that waste and, it, and you know you have the metastable lutetium-177 and it would need to be disposed of as low level radioactive waste. Um, so that's currently where we are with the lutetium-177, um, what we had put out for, in essence, guidance on um, the waste disposal for lutetium. We continue to monitor this and become aware, again, as lutetium is more widely used, um, we'll continue to monitor um, the waste disposal concerns for lutetium. We recognize the cost associated with low-level um, radioactive waste disposal. So there are a couple of other things, not, this isn't necessarily specific for lutetium, I'm, I'm sorry, for actinium, um, it's for any emerging radionuclides. And I wanted just to point out um, a couple of thoughts um, as, as we move forward with, um, with these targeted alpha therapies, is the patient dosimetry. 
um, typically, um, even with our current um, therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals, most of them are just a certain activity-based administration, and it might be based on weight. We understand that with the targeted alpha therapies, there's consideration for mapping the patient's doses and doing some more tumor-specific dosimetry. And as such, that we would might need to have the involvement of medical physicists to help assess or determine those, dose, those doses, dosages for patients. So with some of these targeted alpha, alpha therapies, we might be moving away from just a weight-based administration of the activity but something more mapped out and planned. And if that's the case, there, there would be some additional regulatory considerations. Um, a medical physicists play a large role in our regulations for the, um, the materials under 35600, which are the high dose rate afterloaders and the gamma stereotactic radiosurgery units and requirements for um, medical physicists in those parts of the regulation. So we are very curious on how the dosimetry is going to unfold with the patient dosimetry, that is, determining the appropriate dose for the patient and how that's going to be determined. Um, so that's information we're trying to stay on top of and be aware of as, as we move through clinical trials. Another topic that has been um, of interest at the NRC is extravasation. And so this is the injection or the leakage of the fluid around the injection site. Um, there's a lot of history here, and we could probably spend a little bit more time talking about extravasation. But I'll just leave it at this. Um, with regard to extravasation and the targeted alpha therapies, since um, they would involve a um, one with these targeted alpha therapies, um, even with some of the betas that are emerging as well, um, if that dose is extravasated, what are um, the protocols that should be followed with regard to ensuring a quality injection um, and if there is infiltration or extravasation of that injection in the tissue, um, what's an appropriate protocol for determining how much activity was injected um, or, or extravasated around the injection site and how to determine the dose that was received um, by that surrounding tissue. So there's a lot of interesting things um, that we're looking at at NRC with this. We are looking at some modeling for that um, um, dose at the injection site if a dose were um, extravasated. So this issue plays into the administration protocol. You know, how are these injections given? Um, slow drip over a long period of time. You know, should there be assurances of the injection quality? Should there be additional quality control? And NRC is still, you know, is this even our swim lane, if you will, for NRC to be looking at this injection quality? There's another part to this as well, it's the, with the diagnostic component to um, targeted alpha therapies. They all have, um, would have an, a molecular imaging scan, um, and that scan is what helps to characterize the tumor. And a lot of that is based on the uptake of the material at the tumor and a number of ratios and things like that. Well, if you have a poor injection, how might that impact that whole um, characterization of the tumors? So again, um, it's an area that we're um, looking into, interested in. We have a, um, a current project evaluating extravasations um, at the NRC, but I do see this as probably a more important issue as we um, continue forward with um, emerging radionuclides um, for targeted alpha therapies. And then the last thing, um, again, the long-lived contaminants, um, we're going to continue to monitor what's happening. Um, what, um, right now, we don't, um, we don't um, identify on the license any long-lived contaminants. We just authorize, well, unless you're a license of broad scope, you don't even have radionuclides listed on your license. We, for medical use, you are authorized by one of those modalities, like 35300 materials. But anyway, um, but we don't specifically license the long-lived contaminants um, of any of the radionuclides on a, on a specific medical use license. So that's just a, another thing. Um, you know, what's, what's really going to be the evolving situation with the long-lived contaminants um, with these targeted therapies? So we're very interested in that. 
um, not only because there is a potential patient dose concern, but also the waste disposal concerns, concerns and how we can best mitigate um, and um, any regulatory burdens associated with waste disposal for our medical use licensees. And I think that was it. Thank you very much, Lisa, for the excellent presentation. So now we are moving to the uh, second part of uh, our uh, seminar, where the use of actinium-225 in the laboratory, uh, preclinical and clinical studies will be covered. And our next speaker will be Dr. Vanessa Sanders from Brookhaven National Lab. So she will be talking about radio labeling comparison of accelerator versus generator produced actinium-225. Dr. Sanders, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so as uh, Kate mentioned, um, I'll be discussing with you some of our radio labeling studies of um, comparing the generator produced actinium-225 to the accelerator produced actinium-225. And um, I'll start by apologizing that um, uh, the first few slides are a bit repetitive um, from some of the talks that we've already heard. Um, but we early, earlier we saw a similar slide to this, which depicts the supply and demand for actinium-225. And uh, while the generator production from thorium has been providing actinium-225 for several years, it is insufficiently meeting the demand of actinium-225. The global demand is on the order of 50 to 100 curies per year, um, while the global supply is on the scale of 1.7 curies per year. Thus, we are in um, need of additional alternative production routes. While there are several avenues of alternative production routes being investigated, such as the cyclotron production using radium targets, um, the accelerator production via the thorium-232 um, proton spallation nuclear reaction allows for the production of actinium-225 without the use of special regulated material like U-233. So when evaluating accelerator facilities that produce proton energies within the range of 100 and 150 MeV, it is anticipated that at, in a single 10-day irradiation, um, Los Alamos National Lab can produce upwards of 2.3 curies and BNL can produce around 2 curies of actinium-225. So to leverage these unique accelerator facilities, the TriLab effort was put in place to develop the production route where Los Alamos and Brookhaven would irradiate the thorium targets, and Oak Ridge National Lab would utilize their expertise in um, actinium-225 separation to develop um, the chemical processes. So currently we are in stage two of the effort where we are focused on the routine production of 50 to 100 millicuries of actinium-225. Uh, we are optimizing and evaluating the thorium target as well as the subsequent target processing scheme. And within this stage, we aim to implement the chemistry and scale up the targetry before moving to stage three, which is where the routine production of 100 to 1,000 millicuries of actinium-225 will be implemented. So as previously mentioned, the proton irradiation of thorium-232 targets is a spallation reaction, which other co-products other than actinium-225 are produced. One of those co-products is the production of actinium-227, where about 0.2% is uh, produced during the irradiation. Um, the half-life of this isotope is 21.78 years, and since it has the same um, chemistry as actinium-225, it cannot be chemically separated during the purification process. So this graphic, while it's kind of small, shows the, the decay chain for actinium-227, which is complicated due to its daughter products, namely thorium, radon, and lead, all which could compl complicate waste handling. 
But in addition to that, we also wondered whether the contamination of actinium-227 would have an eventual impact on radio labeling over time. That is, as the ratio of actinium-227 to actinium-225 increases due to the decay of actinium-225, will the presence of these daughter products affect or impact the radio labeling? So we wanted to evaluate the radio labeling yield of accelerator produced actinium-225 and compare it to the radio labeling yields of uh, generator produced actinium-225. We used the following um, protocol of 50 microcuries per reaction and allowed our reactions to heat at 100 degrees C for 30 minutes. We evaluated our reaction solutions at 0, 1, 3, 6, 10, 14, 17, and 21 days post-delivery to our facility, and we evaluated them via ITLC analyses. Our ITLC analysis protocol comes from the reported literature based on actinium dototox studies, and along with evaluating the yields over time, we varied the concentration of solution, of the ligand solution, between 25 micromole and 5 picomole, and we use the DOTA ligand as our ligand of choice. Each reaction was completed in triplicate, and each ITLC analysis was also completed in uh, triplicate. So moving on to our results. Um, first, we have our results using excess ligand concentration, where the metal to ligand ratio was 1 to 60,000. And um, here we see the generator batch, which where we observe high consistent labeling yields throughout all time points. And when we compare the generator batch in blue to the accelerator batch in orange, we um, also observe consistent high radio labeling yields through all time points. Um, though we do notice some larger variances within the data of the accelerator batch. Um, next, we have what we are calling our moderate ligand concentration, where the metal to ligand ratio is 1 to 50. Um, and here with the generator batch, we observe a decrease in labeling yield through all time points. Um, we do observe a low dip around day 9, but through the end of the study, we see that the yields kind of come back up and level off. When we compare the generator batch to the accelerator batch, um, we observe an initially higher labeling yield through the first three time points, but then over the course of the study, um, the yields become more consistent when that, with that of the generator batch. And then finally, um, we have our, what we're calling our low ligand concentration, where the metal to ligand ratio is one to one. And um, again, with the generator batch, we see a decrease in the overall labeling yield throughout all the time points. However, when we compare to the accelerator batch, we immediately observe um, a, um, high labeling yields, once again, through the first few time points. Um, but towards the end of the study, the yields become more consistent with that of the generator batch at our later time points. So overall, the biggest changes in yields come at lower ligand concentrations. Um, we were surprised to observe high labeling yields in early time points with the accelerator material. However, um, with both of the lower ligand concentrations, after about the third time point, the yields of each of the materials are more consistent with each other. Um, the material, the accelerator material that we used for both the 50 to 1 and the 1 to 1 ligand to metal ratio was used from the same batch. Um, and that batch we received on November 18. Since then, we have been able to receive an additional batch and we have started to repeat these studies um, with the accelerator material. And so we're about halfway through analyzing the study, but here I'm showing um, the 50 to one ligand to metal ratio and comparing the batch that we received in November from the batch that we received this past June. And um, here you can see that the initial yields for day zero and one um, 
for the June batch um, are a bit lower than that of the batch that we received in November. However, the yields for the rest of the time point um, thus far are within error of, of each other. Um, when we compare the two batches using the lower ligand concentration, the one-to-one -one metal to ligand concentration, we see larger discrepancies within the data. Um, the material that was received in June labeled with a much lower yield throughout all time points when compared to the material that we received in November. So this is something that we're, we're looking into. So overall, um, this work is still ongoing. We're still completing this um, batch of accelerator material that we have received. Um, overall, there are consistent radio labeling yields at high ligand concentrations. We are observing a reduction in label yield as we reduce the ligand concentration. Um, the initial batch of accelerator material, there's higher labeling yields in early time points. And we are currently evaluating different batches of products to observe um, reproducibility in the study. Um, this is initially showing differences in radio labeling at the one to one lig ligand to metal ratio. We would like to further optimize the ITLC protocol as we continue these studies. And we are currently completing the analysis and calculations to determine the Actinium-227 content for each of these batches. And so um, with that, I'd like to thank everyone who's been involved with this work, uh, Dr. Kathy Cutler, Karen Sykes, Kevin Johns, and Ariel Brown for assisting with getting us the material. I would like to acknowledge the DOE Isotope Program and you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanders, for Thank outstanding you. presentation. Very interesting. So our next speaker will be Dr. Kevin Allen from University of Saskatchewan in Canada. He will be talking about actinium-225 and bismuth-213, two important parameters for the future of therapeutics. Uh, Dr. Allen, please go ahead. Okay, I'll just share my screen. Great, thanks for the introduction, Kate. So I'm going to talk to you all about a few of the experiments our lab has been working with, actinium and bismuth. So a quick recap of radioimmunotherapy, it's where you have an antibody that targets a very specific antigen, typically that of a cancer cell. Now you take this antibody, you label it with a radionuclide, you direct this to the tumor, you ablate the tumor. Now this, it will limit the dose to normal tissues and hopefully provide a very specific tumor killing dose. Now, in collaboration with Actinium Pharmaceuticals, we wanted to, <clears throat> we wanted to explore um, daratumumab. Now, daratumumab is used for the treatment of multiple myeloma. It targets CD38, and it relies on classical FC-dependent mechanisms uh, in order to achieve its therapeutic outcome. Now, unfortunately, not all patients respond to this treatment. So um, we were hoping to improve it with radioactivity. Now, in order to attach the radioisotope onto the antibody, we do have to modify it. Um, and so we have a metal chelator. And just to confirm that we still see uptake in the tumor, um, we labeled it with an imaging agent imaging. So these are mice that are um, bearing dowdy tumors, so they express CD38. And you can see that um, after 24 hours, you begin to see uptake in the tumor. And by seven to 10 days later, you have um, good accumulation of the antibody in this tumor. Now, um, just because we have effective targeting, we want to see if this will increase into a more efficacy with daratumumab. So we labeled this with actinium. And um, so like I mentioned before, daratumumab itself is a therapeutic. So you can see that when you inject 10 micrograms into a mouse with a dowdy tumor, you see a significant reduction of tumor growth rate over time, um, as opposed to just a straight saline injection. Now, when we're going in with labeled daratumumab, we have um, 
only 0.3 micrograms of activity. So we're about 30 times less concentrated um, in terms of antibodies. However, we go in with 200 nanocuries of the actinium itself. So you can see that 0.3 micrograms of daratumumab has no effect on tumor growth rate. However, with actinium attached to it, we see an equivalent effect to that of the therapeutic dose of DARA. Now, when we increase this to 400 nanocuries, we're able to significantly uh, decrease the rate of tumor growth and extend uh, the 50% survival rate of these mice out past that of a therapeutic dose. Now, this was also, we were also able to do this in uh, multiple myeloma cell line. Now, actinium uh, worked great in this instance, and we've seen time before where actinium is amazing and the work done here is just fantastic. However, is actinium always the answer? Now, we've seen several instances in our experiments where um, we didn't get the results with actinium that we achieved using bismuth. So a little bit about bismuth. So bismuth-213 is a daughter of actinium. It's an alpha emitter as well. And it has a very short physical half-life relative to that of actinium's 10-day half-life. We're only working with 46 minutes. Now, this can be an advantage in that once it gets to the tumor, it quickly deposits its dose. However, you also have to get it to the tumor really quickly and you have to work with it really. Um, you have to be very efficient when you're working with it. So you get bismuth from an actinium bismuth generator, which is this little thing right here, which has actinium absorbed onto resin. Um, you elute it every three hours. So you can elute it multiple times a day and then you're working with a much faster reaction time. So when we work with actinium, we have about an hour, as opposed to when we're working with bismuth, we only use around five minutes because we don't want to see too much decay. Um, and then purifying it and injecting it into mice. So from start of elution to actual injection, it takes us around 15 minutes. So we use about a third of a half-life of bismuth to get it into patients. Now, um, occasionally, we do have to do some troubleshooting. And just for anybody that's planning to use bismuth um, in the future, um, if you do see a decrease in labeling over time, um, typically we just rinse it with one molar nitric acid and then a bunch of water and we can get our labeling back up to what it was when it arrived. Now, one of the projects where we use bismuth is melanoma. So this year, there'll be about 100,000 new cases of melanoma with about 6,800 people um, succumbing to this disease. So with an early detection, um, there's quite a good prognosis. However, late stage melanoma has a very um, poor survival rate of only 10 to 15%. So um, in collaboration with Radimmune, we wanted to develop a therapy for melanoma. Now, our strategy here is a little different in that we're targeting melanin itself. So our antibody targets melanin but we only want to target extracellular melanin. So as um, melanoma is growing, those tumors are growing and rapidly devising, there will be cell death. And when these cells die, they'll release melanin into that tumor environment. Now, this is what we want to target as opposed to healthy melanized um, cells out the, in your eyes or on your skin. Now, so to make sure that our antibody does this, we perform biodistributions and imaging and check to see um, if we see any uptake in those organs. So again, here is we labeled our antibody, humanized 8C3 with indium, and we injected into C57 sites that were burying B16 F10 melanoma tumors. And uh, what you can see is that after two hours, you begin to see uptake in the tumor, um, four hours as well. And then um, as time progresses, we see more and more accumulation in the tumor. Now, this is very encouraging for both bismuth and actinium, um, but we also wanted to uh, compare our study in a combination treatment with the st current standard of care, which is um, immunotherapy, so PD-1 treatments. So what we wanted to do was give them a dose of RIT and immunotherapy. And unfortunately, we found that in our hands, um, B16 F10 melanoma tumors didn't respond very well to uh, immunotherapy. So we switched over to an S91 Cloudman tumor. Um, so we then compared the, this combination of bismuth 
and the combination of actinium with PD-1. And you can see that the PD-1 um, tumor growth rate alone was comparable to that of actinium and PD-1 together, whereas we saw a significant uh, reduction in tumor growth rate when we gave them bismuth and PD-1 together. So if we look at survival, we were able to see that our 50% survival for bismuth um, combination therapy was uh, far greater than that of the actinium and PD-1. So this is one of the cases where we've seen that um, bismuth outperformed actinium. Now, another example of this is when Bruce from uh, UMC Utrecht came. Now, Bruce is a doctor who does um, joint implants. And what's known in their field is that occasionally these prosthetic joints get infected with um, bacteria. So he was working with MRSA. And it's very difficult to treat with antibiotics to the point where um, the only solution is to remove those joints and then re-implant them. And there's only so many times you can do this before it becomes a non-viable solution. So what he wanted to do was take an antibody that 4497 that targets wall typoic acids that are present on both the bacteria and the biofilms. Now this is key because the biofilms they form are full of these dormant bacteria that again are super unresponsive to um, just standard antibiotics. So he took that antibody, radio labeled it with both exit, whoops, actinium and bismuth. And um, what he saw here was again, that bismuth was mar far more effective at disrupting these colony, uh, the bacteria and eliminating um, them down. So there's almost no colony forming units left when he analyzed this data. So this is probably due to the fact that the bacteria itself is just so rapidly dividing that the actinium's decay rate is too long where bismuth can deposit all its radioactivity immediately. So a quick summary is that actinium is incredibly potent. We've seen this time and time again where um, it can greatly enhance the therapeutic potential of the small molecules and biologics. However, there are certain instances where um, you have a really aggressive cancer or very fast proliferating infection, that actinium isn't able to function as well as its daughter, bismuth. However, this is all predicated on the fact that we have a lot of actinium available, and I'm glad to see that um, all these efforts are being made to ensure that there's much more. So a quick summary, or a quick acknowledgments. I'd like to thank, of course, Kate, um, Mackenzie, and Ruben for their work on the Melanoma Project, Wojtek for his work on the Dara Tumama project, Bruce for his work on the MRSA, and then all of our funding partners. And thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin, for a very insightful presentation. It was very interesting. So before we move to the last uh, speaker, I just want to say that uh, Karen Sykes from DOE kindly um, notified me that we can have a bit more uh, time after the last uh, talk. So those of you who have questions, please don't go away. And uh, our panel members, please stay a little bit longer for 10 more minutes after the last talk so we can answer the questions uh, asked uh, by our audience. So our uh, last speaker for the speaker's part will be uh, Professor Joseph Jurcic from Columbia University who will be talking about targeted alpha therapy for acute myeloid leukemia. Dr. Jurcic, please go ahead. Uh, thanks very much. It's, uh, it's been a great meeting, so I'm very happy to be, be invited to this. Let's see if I can, there we go. All right, so here are my disclosures. And I wanted to give you a little bit of information on, on the disease that we're talking about here. I'm actually a medical oncologist by training and and uh, specialize in, in leukemias. So acute myeloid leukemia is essentially a disease of, that, that affects normal hematopoiesis. Normally, the marrow, uh, the, the bone marrow goes through a neat and orderly process to make all of the various types of blood cells. But in leukemia, what happens is that there's some, some oncogene perturbations that occur that lead to two major issues. The first is lack of differentiation and the second, increased proliferation. So you can imagine the bone marrow just filling up 
with these useless, immature white blood cells that are incapable of forming normal infection fighting cells like, like neutrophils. There are two major prognostic uh, factors in AML. The first is age. You can see that for patients under the age of 55, the chance of long-term survival is around 40 to 50%. But once you get beyond this and, uh, and, and into your 70s and, and, and 80s, survival is really measured in months. Uh, this has recently improved this with some novel agents, but still it's extremely poor and an incurable disease at this point. The other major prognostic factor is the uh, cytogenetic and molecular abnormalities. So you can see here that various chromosome abnormalities are associated with better prognoses, worse prognosis. And the same is true for a, a myriad of, of molecular uh, point mutations as well. So we've been working with a system targeting CD33, which is seen on about 90% of, of AML cells. It is not seen on the normal hematopoietic stem cell, but it is seen on a number of other myeloid progenitor cells. And this is important because this, this fact that we can target these myeloid progenitor cells does result in an expected toxicity from, uh, from the agents that I'll be talking about. Importantly, though, the CD33 is lost in later stages of myeloid development. It's not seen on mature uh, uh, granulocytes uh, or, or platelets or red blood cells. So the antibody that we've used to target CD33 is known as infuzumab. It's a humanized antibody that's capable of killing by ADCC and can fix human complement. We know that the antibody targets leukemia cells very rapidly in patients without immunogenicity. The antibody by itself has modest activity in relapsed AML and has a response rate of about 10%. And we've previously labeled this antibody with beta emitters, iodine-131 and yttrium-90, and have shown that it's extremely potent and can eliminate large leukemic burdens. But with this modality, often, uh, the treatment needs to be given in conjunction with stem cell transplantation. So we were interested in targeting more specifically leukemia cells and sparing surrounding normal cells. And so that's why we became interested in alpha particle emitters. And in our initial clinical studies, we looked at bismuth-213, which was uh, very nicely highlighted uh, by Kevin. So, there's the generator that we use. Again, uh, the actinium is held by a resin. Bismuth 213 is eluted, labeled to uh, an antibody using a DTPA chelate. In that first trial, we gave up to one millicurie per kilogram uh, in patients. And because only so much actinium, could, uh, so much bismuth could be eluted from this generator at any one time, we escalated the dose by increasing the number of fractions. So, we gave two to, uh, three to seven fractions over two to four days in this initial study. And as expected, myelosuppression was the major toxicity, again, because of the expression of CD33 on normal myeloid progenitor cells. Still, the median uh, duration of myelosuppression was 22 days, which is less than you might see with traditional chemotherapeutic agents. We also know that, C, uh, that CD33 is expressed on Kupfer cells. And so, the liver as an organ itself is, is receiving a significant amount of radiation. However, it's interesting, in the case of alpha particle emissions, those emissions may be targeted towards leukemia cells within the liver or Kupfer cells, leaving the uh, normal hepatocytes relatively unspared. Uh, for, and, and this is the reason why perhaps there was less uh, liver function abnormality seen with, uh, with the alpha particle than with earlier beta particle emitters. Uh, we did not reach a maximum tolerated dose in the study. Rather, we were limited by the availability of the actinium uh, bismuth generators. But we did see evidence of clinical activity with 14 of the 18 patients in the study having reductions in their bone marrow leukemia cells. As I mentioned, we were uh, able to compare the dosimetry of bismuth-213 labeled Juntuzumab uh, with the beta particle emitters iodine-131 and yttrium-90. And these calculations were made by George Seguros. And you can see quite dramatically, marrow to whole body dose ratios are about a, a 
thousand to 10,000 times uh, greater for the uh, alpha particle emitter than the beta particle emitters due to the very uh, short range and focused radiation of, of uh, bismuth 213. So one of the, one of the issues with this, this sort of therapy is that the short range and the high linear energy transfer really make this best suited to small volume disease. When someone presents with acute leukemia, they have about 10 to the 12th leukemia cells in their body. That means there's about 10 to the 16, uh, 16 um, CD33 binding sites. And at the specific activities that were achievable in the study, it would be difficult to, uh, to, to target adequate numbers of bismuth cells to each leukemia cell. And so we hypothesized that if we reduce the amount of leukemia in the body and then came in with bismuth 213 as a cleanup, Sorry, they have some. Hello, I'm in the middle of giving a lecture. I'm going to call you back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, um, so, as, as I said, by reducing the amount of leukemia cells, we can then perhaps use bismuth 213 as a way to clean up residual disease. So, we gave non remittive doses of a standard chemotherapeutic agent called cytarabine. Uh, and uh, this was followed by uh, bismuth. Uh, 213 labeled lentuzumab once again uh, in this phase one, two study. And we found something very interesting uh, in the dosimetry studies that we did in, in this particular, um, uh, particular trial. You can see, see here after the first dose of bismuth 213, again, we were able to image uh, the, uh, the 440 kilo electron volt uh, uh, gamma emissions uh, of, of this particular isotope we were able to see targeting to the, uh, to the marrow of the vertebrae, the liver, and the spleen. And in these rate uh, imaging where uh, uptake is shown in red and clearance is shown in, in blue, you can see very nice uptake by the marrow, uh, the liver, and the spleen after the first dose. Then after the last dose uh, injection, you can see kind of a, a general fuzziness, no real uptake uh, on the rate imaging, and evidence of blood pooling. Here's the heart. Uh, and so this would suggest, in fact, we were able to target all of the available CD33 sites. And indeed, uh, uh, several of the patients we treated in this study uh, achieved a complete remission. Now, in, interestingly enough, this was achieved only in patients who had untreated AML or those who had untreated relapse. In other words, in other words they retained some sensitivity to the chemotherapy. Those patients that had never responded to chemotherapy or had relapsed and then been treated for their relapse and didn't respond, essentially lost all chemosensitivity, had no remissions. So that was an important lesson. Well, actinium-213 uh, actinium was, uh, was in many ways, uh, it solved some of the logistical problems of bismuth-213. As has been mentioned before, bismuth-213 has a 46-minute half-life, so labeling has to occur immediately before injection. Uh, I remember in the days, uh, the, the radio pharmacist that we were working with at the time, Ron Finney, used to run to the, run to the patient's uh, bedside um, before all the drug was essentially decayed. So while those studies were going on, Mike McDivitt in the laboratory of David Scheinberg at Sloan Kettering was working on methods to label actinium-225 directly to antibodies. And this was done uh, with a two-stage labeling process at the time uh, using uh, the bifunctional chelate DOTA. Um, and you can see that these actinium constructs were about 1,000 to 10,000 times more potent uh, in vitro than their bismuth analogs. We can see this in a prostate cell line, a lymphoma cell line, and uh, in a myeloid leukemia cell line. Moreover, uh, single nanocurie doses of uh, tumor-specific actinium-225 labeled antibodies could prolong the survival in mice. And shown here is uh, the results of uh, a, a system of prostate cancer. So that led us to a phase one study of actinium-225 labeled lentuzumab in which 18 patients were treated with up to four microcuries per kilogram. Again, uh, the, the dose-limiting uh, toxicity in this study was myelosuppression as expected. One of the great concerns as we began these studies was would there be renal toxicity? 
So as actinium decays, it releases its daughters that could potentially roam freely throughout the body. And we know that free bismuth is taken up by the kidney. Well, interestingly enough, there was no kidney toxicity whatsoever uh, in this study, likely because once internalized, uh, the daughters would remain uh, in the cell and, uh, and not be released into the circulation. Um, the maximum tolerated dose was three millicuries, or three, sorry, three microcuries per kilogram in this study. And we did see evidence of clinical activity with reductions in bone marrow blasts. Uh, and three of these patients actually achieved a marrow remission with uh, less than 5% blasts um, at, at varying doses. We were able to look at the pharmacokinetics of actinium-225 uh, intuzumab uh, by looking at uh, the, uh, the daughters of actinium, francium-221 and bismuth-213, and, uh, gamma, and, and performing uh, gamma counting for these uh, various energies. We saw traditional two-phase elimination kinetics with a half-life of a little under two days. And this would be similar to what we saw in earlier studies with uh, with the beta emitters iodine-131 and yttrium, but very distinct from bismuth-213 constructs where the, uh, where the biological half-life of the construct is really dominated by the, the very short physical half-life of bismuth-213. So trying to replicate the results that we saw with uh, the cytoreduction in bismuth, uh, with, uh, followed by bismuth-213, we did the same uh, for older patients with untreated acute myeloid leukemia, we gave them low-dose cytarabine, followed by two fractions of actinium-225 lentuzumab with escalating doses. And then patients were allowed to undergo subsequent cycles on a monthly basis of cytarabine. So patients only received two doses of actinium throughout. Interestingly enough, we did see responses uh, across most of the dose levels, not at the earliest dose level, but we did see responses throughout for an overall response rate of about 30%. Interestingly, all of the responses were seen after the first cycle, suggesting that most of the heavy lifting in this trial was really done by the actinium, and additional cytarabine afterwards didn't convert any of the responding patients to a complete response. The other interesting thing to come out of this study was we were trying to look at essentially for, for a biomarker. And so we looked at a number of factors, age, disease characteristics, disease burden, other treatments that were given, dosing schemes, and the only thing that proved a significant predictor of response was the number of peripheral uh, blood uh, leukemia cells uh, at the time of treatment. So you can see for patients who had less than 200 uh, blasts per microliter, the response rate was 42%. Whereas those who had more than 200, micro, uh, 200 uh, cells per microliter, none of the patients responded. So this is likely because the drug was the circulating blast served as an antigen sink, if you will. The antibody was bound up by circulating cells, preventing the, the delivery of the construct and the radiation uh, to the marrow space, which is, of course, where, where the drug needs to go. So that led us to a, a monotherapy study uh, looking at actinium-225 lentuzumab and in a fractionated dose scheme um, in patients with untreated uh, acute myeloid leukemia. So we saw at the higher dose, uh, at, uh, at uh, 74 kilobecquerels per kilogram, response rate of 69%. Uh, however, and we did see significant myelosuppression with grade four thrombocytopenia uh, lasting greater than six weeks in 46% of those patients, grade four neutropenia uh, greater than th in 38% of patients. So we looked at a lower dose. And of course, this came at a price. The response rate dropped significantly um, however, the myelosuppression dropped only modestly. And so this drug certainly has, has significant activity in, in myeloid leukemia, as well as in uh, a pre-leukemic state called myelodysplastic syndrome. And because of this, we now have a, a very robust uh, plan to develop this further in combination with, with other uh, therapeutic modalities. And so this is typical of, of um, well, most drugs in oncology where in fact they work best when you use them in combination. And so we think higher doses of actinium-225 lentuzumab would be very useful in conditioning for uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant in patients with high-risk myelodysplastic syndrome. 
lower doses of actinium uh, labeled anti CD33 antibody would be useful in combination therapies uh, with uh, the BCL2 inhibitor venetoclax. Already we're seeing um, some promising results in combination with a standard salvage chemotherapy regimen CLAG M uh, by investigators in Minnesota. And we're plan based on this, we're planning on using this upfront in patients in combination with standard uh, chemotherapy for AML. And then one very interesting application would be lower dose therapy in the setting of minimal residual disease. One of the big problems in AML is that you can get a remission, but leave residual disease. And with this, over time, the patients will go on to relapse. If we can eliminate that residual disease uh, with, with the modality such as, uh, such as radioimmunotherapy, uh, we may be able to extend the lives of our patients and, and, and affect more cures. So you can see that these early studies with bismuth-213 lentuzumab provided proof of principle that we could systemically administer targeted alpha particle therapy. And the actinium construct was certainly active in advanced AML and has produced remissions in older patients with untreated AML as a single agent and in combination with low-dose cytarity. And these are the studies that will provide the rationale for the use of actinium-225 lentuzumab in combination with various other agents in both AML and in myelodysplastic syndrome. So I'd like to acknowledge a lot of investigators over the many years who've been working on this project uh, at multiple institutions, particularly my mentor, oops, I lost that, David Scheinberg at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, all of the investigators in the multi-center trial, and of course, uh, collaborators at various institutions uh, across, the, uh, across the country and, and internationally as well. So thanks very much for listening, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jurcic, for outstanding and enlightening presentation. And um, we now will move into the question and answer session. And while you're at your virtual speaker stand, I would like to direct uh, the question which was directed to the whole panel, but I think uh, you will be uh, the one who could answer is the best. So basically the question is, um, uh, do you consider organ dosimetry uh, in addition to the tumor dosimetry useful in the work if it could be related say to DLT in particular patient? What's your opinion about that? Yeah, so I, I do think that organ dosimetry is important, but I think when you're thinking about organ dosimetry in the traditional sense, you're looking at the average amount of radiation delivered to that entire organ. And in fact, for alpha particle therapy, uh, micro dosimetry may be far more important. I uh, alluded to the example of, of the liver, for instance. So you can imagine that you have normal hepatocytes mixed with Kupfer cells and leukemia cells within the liver. Right? So if, if we're targeting CD33, right, most of that energy is going to be delivered presumably to leukemia cells or other immune cells within the liver, leaving the hepatocytes unspared. So looking at the amount of radiation over the entire organ is not necessarily going to be informative. So really, I think we need very careful studies uh, to, to, to look at microdosimetry to predict organ uh, toxicity. And there are so many variables in, involved with this, it, it becomes quite difficult. And the other issue is imaging actinium-225 is also difficult because of the low dose rate or the low rate of production of, of, of gamma emissions. So it's much easier to do with, with bismuth-213. Um, and so that, that will also be a challenge moving forward um, because of the, uh, the dose rate questions uh, with, with actinium. Okay, thank you so much for answering this question. So I will now read the uh, questions uh, to other members uh, of the panel aloud so um, uh, they can uh, answer them. Uh, so. Um, uh, this is the question, uh, what guidance does the FDA give uh, for the difficulties associated with radio HPLC, quality control of actinium-225 end products? Will TLC data be sufficient for both purity and identity of the product? I think this is towards uh, uh, Dr. Kaslaval. Uh, please, if you could answer that. Dr. Kaslaval, are you still with us? You. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, the radiochemical purity is really uh, depending on the type of product. 
uh, a blanket statement is TSC sufficient? Um, it, it may, it may not be uh, very difficult to say. Uh, if you have actinium-225 radio label product, you may be doing uh, uh, size exclusion chromatography to characterize the protein, high molecular weight, low molecular weight, um, things like that in conjunction with TLC. TLC is useful in radio pharmaceutical product as, uh, you know, uh, there's no loss of radioactivity per se. So you can see everything that you spot. Uh, so it's beneficial in that, but it may not be stability indicating. So you may not be able to assess uh, a degradation of the product uh, uh, completely. So uh, it, it depends. Uh, uh, it's very difficult to say one way or the other. Uh, it, it's a product dependent uh, and the method dependent. Uh, uh, we would recommend that, you, you know, when you're developing this, uh, even prior to IND, you can request a meeting with FDA uh, to discuss some of these. Uh, if not uh, in-person meeting, you can request written only answer. So uh, uh, explaining the, you know, specific situation and the methodology, we may be able to comment a little bit better on that. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your answer. So uh, there is a question for uh, Kevin. Is it possible that the increased efficacy of bismuth-213 is due to actinium-225 decay possibly disrupting the chelator and leading to non-specific uptake of the daughter product, whereas the direct bismuth-213 radio pharmaceutical increases the amount of bismuth-213 that actually makes it to the target? Um, I don't I don't believe that's the case because um, there are examples where actinium by using the same chelator does make it to the tumor and irradiates it and does eliminate this tumor. Um, we've also done stability testing with these where we know that the um, radio label does stay on the antibody for um, weeks. So I don't really think it's just that the actinium is not stable enough. Now, when it does decay, of course, that will destroy the chelator um, because of the energy. Um, but at that point, you've already released an alpha particle into the tumor. So maybe if the business leaks out, you won't get the second alpha particle. But um, I, don't, I don't think that's the exact reason why we're seeing it. It might have to do with um, tumor growth rates are just too quick with this melanoma line that we're working with but we haven't completely investigated all those options. Right, so there is a, another a question for you. Um, for the MRSA RIT, what were the activities of actinium-225 and bismuth-213 used? What were the MiG-90 activities? Were actinium and bismuth conjugate stability comparable in culture? Um, so for the activity, I believe we used about seven we went up to 7.5 kilobex with the actinium and for the bismuth, I think around 130 kilobex. Um, I don't know the exact MIC-90. I think if you email Bruce, he would know all this a lot better than I would. Um, as for stability, so the stability of a bismuth labeled antibody is pretty difficult to check just because its decay rate is so quickly, is so quick that you know you can do a one and two and three hour time point, but then after that you're running out of activity to look for. The actinium, I believe they were stable, and again with lutetium, they were stable as well. Okay, thank you very much. So the next question I think would be best answered by uh, Dr. Sanders. So the question is, uh, how do you distinguish separate actinium radio-labeled product versus bismuth radio-labeled product after the reaction? So we aren't separating um, actinium from bismuth. So in our analyses, we do um, ITLC to separate free actinium from labeled actinium. And then we follow that up based on the location on the TLC with analysis using um, high purity and germanium detection to determine um, radio uh, nucleic purity. 
Okay, thank you so much. So there is a question for Dr. Kaslewal. Again, will the FDA require applicants of Actinium 225 radiopharmaceuticals to determine the fate of all decay products or will end decay dosimetry be sufficient? Okay. Um, I'm trying to understand the question. So the fate of all the decay products. So if you, if you look at the chain, uh, I'm assuming it's uh, related to pharmacokinetics, um, uh, elimination of uh, uh, the decay products. Uh, as mentioned, uh, you know, you have an actinium chelated to the chelator. Uh, once it decays, some of them are very short half-life products. Uh, their chelation properties may not be, you know, they may not remain chelated. Some of the decay products may remain chelated. Um, uh, so uh, it's very difficult to, um, I'm not sure how you can do it. Uh, the way I'm looking at it is, uh, uh, is uh, its safety is built into, um, you know, when you're doing uh, the overall clinical trials. Um, for both safety and effectiveness. Uh, uh, so that is built in um, into that. Um, okay. Not, yeah, and uh, and decay dosimetry, I'm, I'm trying to understand. Uh, we do have a, a medical physicist, uh, you know, dosimetry with alpha is difficult to begin with. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, incorporating all these uh, various uh, DK product into the dosimetry uh, will be a difficult task. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kasselwell. So uh, uh, I will ask one last question so we can finish at 10.45. The question is for Dr. Cutler. So if radium-226 is relatively rare, how can a target with a significant mass be developed to produce actinium-225 via an E-beam? I think that's a, a really good question. And um, when I showed you all the different production paths that the isotope program looked at, that was one of the reasons why they chose to go with a thorium target is that the radium-226, um, besides the fact that it makes radioactive gases, but the availability was really limited. Um, so it was difficult to see that you would have sufficient amounts to make what would be needed into clinical trials. Um, so, I, I agree. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Katla. So, at this, uh, I would like to thank our outstanding panelists and speakers for their talks and answering the questions. I would like to thank the DOE organizers for organizing that whole uh, wonderful user meeting so we can all be uh, informed about the latest development in the actinium field and thank you very much for attending and asking your questions. Take care and goodbye.